Good morning. Uh, welcome to the fifth annual National Paediatric Diabetes Audit Conference, our first one of these online. So this is a new experience for us. We've been practicing this morning and we practiced yesterday and the day before trying to get the presentations to load and mostly it's been going really fine. So hoping not to have any technical issues today because unlike our physical conferences, there's no tech person we can run to to fix everything. So um, looking forward to a smooth morning and just really delighted to um, share with you some presentations that we've got. One of the best things about being virtual is that we can have more international speakers, which add a real important insight to the work and, and to show us that it's not just us as a British clinical community trying to do the best we can for children and young people with diabetes. So really, really excited to introduce our international guests and our local talent as well. So um, just wanted to say before we kick off all the presentations, thank you so much to your support to the audit uh, over the past year or since the pandemic began. When we all met together for our conference in London in January 2020, we had no idea what was coming, of course, and what a strange time it has been. We're still not back in the office. I haven't seen my team together since March of last year. Um, so I just wanted to thank you so much for all the data that you've continued to submit, uh, which is just keeping the audit going from strength to strength, even in these really difficult times. So thank you for your support. Now, our first speaker is our very own Professor Justin Warner, and I've seen how many slides he has, and it's making me very nervous about the running time of this conference. So I'm not going to say any more than that, so we can just kick off with Justin. So. Um, Justin, you're going to speak to us about 10 years of the NPDA at the RCPCH. And I think I see your presentation going live. Um, thank you. Yes, I am. So um, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Holly. 10 years ago, when I became the clinical lead for the NPDA, I never thought I'd be presented from, presenting from my kitchen. <laughs> but anyway, here we are this morning. And uh, just to reiterate, I'm going, I'm going to talk about 10 years and I, picking out slides to, for, to, to demonstrate what we've done in 10 years is quite difficult in 25 minutes, but it is a real success story. We've got lots of work still to do, um, but I'm gonna try and cover that, cover that. And just to reiterate what Holly said, this is all your data, it's all your work. You are the people who do the work out there and, it, and it, you should give yourselves a round of applause at the end because uh, this is up, it's you that's made these improvements. Um, so I'm going to start just by reminding you who this gentleman was. This was Lord Deming, and this is the reason why we're all here doing audit. So he was the forefather of audit, and he described what is now known as the Deming cycle, which is about quality service improvement. He was an industrialist. He was a car manufacturer. He wasn't a medic at all. But he first described this PDSA cycle. You plan something, you do it, you collect data, you study the data, you make some recommendations, and then you go round and round uh, this circle again and again, doing the PDSA cycle with the plan is that you improve all the time. And if you don't, if you go backwards, then you've done something wrong and you try again. And you should go round and round this cycle, pushing up quality. So 10 years ago, these were the documents that were around. Some of you may remember these. These are the strategy documents we had for the P part of the planning uh, of the audit when the RCPCH took over the audit in 2011. Um, there already was an existing National Paediatric Diabetes Audit, which had been running since 2003. Um, but one of the problems with it was that it was not 100% participation. If you look at this map of England and Wales, the black dots are centres that have registered but never submitted data. And we knew that even in those centres that had submitted the, the data, um, the uptake was poor. The Royal College did a survey in 2010 and found about double the numbers of children with type 1 diabetes than were being reported to the audit. So we had a lot of work to do in those early days um, getting the numbers up. 
So there we are, 80% were registered in England. Wales, where I come from, of course, were very good in two shoes and were doing extremely well at that point. The other issue is that the outcome for children with type 1 diabetes was not particularly good. Um, these are in the old percentages, which some of you will remember, 8.7 is about 72 millimoles per mole. So in 2015, we were sitting there at 8.7%. And the following year, it was still 8.7%. And lo and behold, the following year, it was 8.7%. And it went uh, 2008, 2009, 8.7%. And the year we took over the audit was 8.8%. So nothing was happening uh, particularly fast. And this was on the background of the things that were happening around Europe. So this is German data from the DPV. Uh, registry demonstrating that over that same sort of time period there have been quite uh, drastic improvements in uh, HB1C uh, with a, a fall of about 0.1 of a percent per annum. So Sheila Shribnam who was the National Clinical Director for Young People Maternity, she, she wrote the foreword in 2007-2008 paediatric audit report. This is before the college took it over and she wrote this disappointing situation cannot be allowed to continue. Action to prevent and manage acute and long-term complications of diabetes must start on day one of diagnosis and continue lifelong. NICE produced clear guidance five years ago and more recently. Why has so little progress been made in implementing it? And she went on to say act now. The progression of diabetes is relentless. We have the knowledge we need to use it and take responsibility and benchmark our efforts against others in order to improve further. Children and young people deserve nothing less. So that was the situation we were in in 2010. And then appeared on the scene uh, a young lady called Fiona Campbell. I hope she's in the audience. She's probably laughing now. And uh, um, she produced this cartoon which I've been alleged to call Fiona's flower, so be careful how, how I pronounce that. But she produced this cartoon about um, a five-year strategy for improving outcomes. That's the centre of the flower there. And she based it around the development of national paediatric diabetes networks as being a driver for service improvement. They need to be safe, they need to be effective, they need to be efficient and sustainable. And then all these little petals around the edge uh, have got um, areas which need to be addressed to improve outcomes for children. And Fiona and I used to present this flower a lot and we don't use it very, as much as we do now. Not that we completed the task, but that it's, it, it's been superseded by lots of other um, quality improvement uh, initiatives. So what's happened over the last 10 years, I'm going to quick go straight to the, the highlight, if you like, of, of the talk. There's been uh, a considerable improvement and year on year it's taken me great pleasure to put the next year, next year's worth of data in. And if you look in the far right, the 2019-20, which is the report that's about to appear on your desk, we're down to 61.5, that's the median h c having come from 72 10 years ago. So there's a fall of 10 millimoles per mole. And in terms of reducing the risk of long term complications of the condition, that is a considerable uh, improvement and, and will save the burden on those children massively uh, in, the, in the future. Um, the other thing that has happened is the completion rates of healthcare checks has improved dramatically. So if you look back in 2010-11, we were on about five or six percent being completed of all seven. We're now on about 55 percent. Uh, and if you look at all the individual ones, some of these now are, are up to 100 percent and those that aren't are, are well over 70 percent. So there's been dramatic improvements in the completion of those um, checks. So people often say to me, well, well, how did you do that? How, how did you reduce that by 10 millimoles per mole? And the answer is, of course, I don't know the answer. If I knew that, it would be great. We just carry on using the same algorithms. But what did happen is there were a lot of changes going on. And in 2010, there was the development of the regional networks. Initially in England, it came to Wales a bit later. 
the RCPCH took over the, the audit and, and hopefully was presenting data back to you in a way that helped you to improve. And the first thing we did was unit disclosure. So you were no longer PZ113, you actually became Cardiff and Bell NHS Trust or NHS Health Board. Um, then came in in England, the best practice tariff. Uh, and you've had a lot of money in England around that. That's about to be withdrawn, as you probably know, so you need to be thinking about the integrated uh, care strategy and how you might um, uh, involve your management with that. Then there was um, peer review, the quality assurance, uh, assurance programmes that came in, in initially in England and followed uh, in Wales, along with delivery plans. Uh, and then there's been a lot of work around QI and QA consolidation and the quality improvement programme, which many of you will have taken part in, and the explosion in the use of um, technology. So lots of things um, going on. And what this has meant is that the children who are reaching the targets set by NICE have increased dramatically. So if you look at the blue on the left hand side, all the blues are different shades there. But if you look at all the blues, that's under 58. And back in 2010, that was around about 15% of children. We're now up to about 35% of children. And more importantly, if you look on the right hand side of this diagram, there's been a halving of those children who had an hb c greater than 80 uh, millimoles. These are the ones who are at high risk. So you might say, well, great, store is over, we've done our job, uh, we don't need to do anything more. But you're going to hear from Gunn shortly about successes in Sweden. But if you look at the Swedish data, it's quite remarkable because that's a similar sort of graph I showed you in the UK, but on a slightly different scale. You see on the far right hand side, they're down to around about 56, 57 millimoles but this is their average in uh, in Sweden and if I superimpose my UK data on top of that you can see that we're still a, a long way to go to get to what they achieve in Sweden and if you move us backwards we're now at the level of Sweden were in about 2012 so we've got about eight or nine years to catch up and one of the problems is they keep getting better so as fast as we try and catch them uh, they keep improving as well which is which is excellent news. I think what became obvious to me in the early days of when I started in the audit was the massive amount of variation that there is across the country. So there are units who've got an average H1C of 58 and there are some who've got an average H1C of 78. Uh, and started to think about what it is that might lead to that variation. And this cartoon I've always found quite useful. That you can divide those causes of variation up into those that are warranted and those that are unwarranted. So the warranted ones are things that you probably can't change, such as the duration that somebody has diabetes, their age, their gender, their social economic group, their ethnicity. Whereas the unwarranted are things that you can do something about. Um, they're about your, the way you run your clinic, how you use your tariff, how you use your structured education programme. So those are the things we all need to, to work upon. And we started to think about how we could adjust the HbA1c so that we could compare centres with one another in a more um, meaningful way and a, and a fairer way. So if you present, if you had a clinic, for instance, that had high social deprivation uh, and were all teenagers, you were likely to have a higher H1C than some than a unit that had young children all in social class one uh, and you couldn't really compare yourselves to one another. So we now adjust H1C taking into account uh, those factors. Uh, and produced this lovely flannel plot, which you all have become familiar with over the last six or seven years. So it's just plotting the distribution of the adjusted H1C against the number of people in the clinic. And even after taking into account those warranted effects, which only account for about 10% of the variability, you can see there's still quite a lot of variation. And the funnel, which is a statistically derived um, methodology, allows us to 
um, show who are extreme outliers. So the red area is those who have an extremely high H1C and the green areas are the very positive extreme outliers who are doing extremely well. And this, this, the purpose of doing this is not to point fingers at people and say, you're not doing very well, ha ha, we're doing much better than you. This is about identifying a unit that which might need some help in trying to, to, to improve. And sometimes people don't know why they are extreme outliers. Uh, and uh, things like peer review can help that process and understand a little bit better about how you might uh, improve. Remember that the, the background is that as fast as you, you might be improving, but everyone else is improving at the same time. So you need to improve faster to get out of that red uh, area. So we also turn to um, uh, other parts of the world to so compare our outcomes uh, with other countries. And this is a piece of work that Dimitrios Sharampopoulos from the Child Policy Research Unit did a number of years ago. And he went out to Germany and analysed the data of all these countries, which are outlined in the slide here. And what he was able to produce was this uh, these curves for each country, and I'll go through each country in a minute. This is the distribution of their HBA1 cents, HBO1C for each registry. Uh, and if I start by showing you the Sweden data, so that's the red curve, Sweden, very good average HBA1C, this bad target of what was 58 then in those days. Um, you can see that they have a good average, but they have a very low center spread. So the variability around that average is actually very low. Whereas if you look at Germany, who also have a very similar good average, the distribution is massive. So, so the units performing quite poorly out here and some performing extremely well uh, out on, on the left. So a much wider centre spread. And out here on the right is the England and Wales and the USA data. So we have a relatively poor average, or we did then, with a moderate centre spread. And in the middle here, we have Norway and Denmark. So if we want to improve, we've got to move our curve towards the red one uh, on the left. And in this year's audit, this uh, um, Sarah, who's our statistician, has produced this lovely graph showing that indeed that is what we're doing, because this is looking at that same curve, that bell-shaped curve, the orange being 2009-10, so where we started, and the blue being now 2019-20. And you can see a clear shift to the left, and not only there is a shift to the left, the distribution is narrower. So if you look over here at standard deviation, we've gone from 18.3 to now 16.9. So we're moving the data to the left, which is what we should do, and we're compressing it. So the variability is getting less. So it's doing all the right uh, things. So what has the audit told us about technology usage? A massive explosion, you'll know, in your own sense of technology usage. But has it actually made a, dis a difference? We know there are lots of lovely research, randomised controlled studies out there showing it makes a difference. But audit is a natural experiment, if you like. So this is this is another work, piece of work that Sarah has done uh, um, using a regression model and putting in to it the HB1C outcome and looking at uh, the use of MDI or CDM or pumps uh, and taking into account also those other warranted effects such as age, gender, duration, ethnicity and deprivation. And I'll just pull out what I want you to look at, which is the top bit here. So if you are on MDI and you add into that the use of CGM, you might hope to reduce your H1C by about 2.5 uh, millimoles, this number over here. If you're on a pump but not using CGM, you, you're reducing your H1C by about five. Uh, and if you're an insulin pump and you add in CGM, that would go up to about uh, six. And this is after taking into account all the other things like social deprivation. But interestingly, if you look down the bottom here, you can see the deprivation has almost the same 
uh, increment of HbA1c of about six millimoles per mole, moving from the most deprived to the least deprived area. So you might say, well, that's that's very interesting, and let's put everyone on a, on a, on a pump at a CGM, and uh, we'll sort the problem out. So this is data from Sweden again. I was choose Sweden. I know guns on the line because they have very good uh, data. So this is looking at their pump usage uh, by age, and each of the bars are different year cohorts. And you can see there using somewhere in the region 60 to 80 percent of their children are on pumps. If I superimpose the UK data or the England Wales data, we're about half that. And if you look at CGM, whereas in, in Sweden they're up to 80 to 90 percent, if you look in, in the UK we're way down to about 10 percent, maybe a little bit more in the last um, couple of years. So we're asking people to drive cars with no windows in them and this is uh, since we now have CDM, we should uh, be using it. But is it as straightforward as that? Well, no, nothing ever is. And this is a piece of work we've just completed, which is uh, the manuscript about to be uh, sent for peer review shortly. This is a piece of work we've done with the um, DPV, so that's German Austria Registry, and the Type 1 Diabetes Exchange, that's the American Registry. And this graph shows HB1C. So the, the diamonds are England and Wales. You can show, show you that gradual improvement in HB1C. The, the, the squares are the DPV, so they're much better than us, but almost on a plateau, if you like, with their average HB1C. But in the US, you can see the HB1C is actually going up, which is very worrying to them. Now, if you look at pump usage, you can see that uh, we are the least users of pumps down here, yet we're improving. Uh, Germany, there's a gradual increase in pumps, but in the United States, they use about double the amount of pumps that we have. So it's not all about putting everyone on a pump and it'll sort the problem out, because they've got increasing pump usage, yet deteriorating HbA1c. And if you look at CGM, you see a similar sort of picture uh, in... Um, uh, is the NPDA, we're, we're down here at about 10%. Uh, DPV, there's suddenly a jump up here because it became remunerated and they're um, paid for by the government. And this is the American data um, gradually increasing. So a lot of things have been tackled over the last 10 years and they're still ongoing, but what do I think we need to tackle next? Well, the sad thing is that there is still a lot of um, variability around deprivation and ethnicity. And this graph shows you the HB1C over the last uh, five or six years stratified for deprivation. And since 2013-14, you can see although in every single group there's been an improvement in HB1C, this gap between the least deprived and most deprived still remains. And I think that's an area we need to think about and tackle. And if you look at ethnicity, you'll see a similar sort of problem. Everyone's improving, but there's still a big margin between black children out here in the gray and the white children in the blue. And if you look at access to technology, again, you can see there's quite a difference. So on the left is by ethnicity, so white children about 40%, down to black children about 26% having access to pumps. And if you look at, at, at deprivation, you see a similar picture, most deprived 31% against 44% in the least deprived. And things seem to be getting worse. So if you look at the orange line here, this shows you the, um, the pump usage. And I've just pulled out the uh, most deprived, which is the, the squares, and the least deprived, which are the diamonds. And you can see in 2014, there was nearly an 8% difference in pump usage, and that's now up to about just over 12%. So it, the problem's getting bigger. There's now the online tools to review your data, and you can look at your unit, you can look at other people's units, you can draw graphs, you can create presentations from that. Um, we communicate, I think, the results much better with you with some of these um, diagrams and charts, which you can see on the left, and the slide panel 
the, uh, the bottom right. Uh, we're much better engaging with families. Uh, this is the parent and carers report. Uh, and we produce those posters on the right hand side that you put up in your clinic, which, which is for your parents and patients to see where your clinic um, rank. We produce a massive array of reports and I think I've managed to get them all in there. There's probably one or two uh, missing. They've become more colourful as the years have gone by. This is the latest one, which is going to appear hopefully next uh, week. Um, and uh, Katie Lamb, who drew this picture from last year, is going to be speaking to us a little bit later about art and diabetes. Um, there's been a huge amount of research that's come out from the MPDA with some of those linkages with other uh, centres around Europe and across the across to the states uh, and Rob French is going to talk a little bit later about some linkage with educational outcomes from use of uh, um, audit data. So I'm going to conclude that point by saying I think there's been dramatic improvements. This is all up to you. You should give yourself a round of applause. Uh, massive improvements have come of outcomes for children and young people in the last 10 years. And I think it's been brought about by the development networks, the peer review pro process and the quality improvement program. And I like to think that the MPD have played their part in, in all of that. I know we analyse data and throw it back to you, but I hope and I know that you are using that data to improve. I think now is time to reflect after two years, particularly after a year of, of COVID, we've had to learn to do things a little bit differently. We have to learn to communicate with families in a different way. You know, where do we communicate with them? Um, many of us have done consultations with, with children sitting in cars outside schools and all sorts of things. How frequently do we need to, to, to consult our families? Do, does every family need to be seen every three months or is some much better every six months. And then we need to think about how we tackle the children living in deprived and ethnic minority groups and how we might help them uh, to improve. And I've put type two here partly because I know you've just submitted data on type two and there'll be a spotlight order coming up on that. I haven't spoken about type two, but that is a, a, an area that we need to address. That's the next, uh, the picture on the front of the next audit coming out hopefully next week. There are two bits to this year. The one on the left is the full report like you're used to, the 120 to page document. The one on the right is a much more summarised version, which we've been asked to produce more for, for the managerial side, but you can read either. So Holly, I think I've kept to 19 minutes. Is that right? So certainly on time. Um, uh, and all these people help me with, with, with producing an audit. I get to stand up at nice conferences as I just showed you but the team at the RCPCH keep the whole thing going and all these other people uh, feed into the project boards and the methodology groups. So thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. You actually took 32 minutes, but um, we'll, <laughs> we'll let you off because that was quality content, but it means that we don't have any more time for questions before uh, we hear from Professor Tade Vatalino, who I can see has just joined us. Excellent timing, Tade. I can see that you're on mute right now, so we'd be very grateful if you, perfect, you've taken that off. And are you happy to load your slides now? I, I am very happy to are load. Are you doing that? Okay. I see very familiar faces and I really enjoyed your lecture. I was actually with you, but I had to rejoin as a presenter, I understand. So that's why it's it's lovely and particularly the new manuscript with DPV and uh, beautiful data. So uh, my my congratulations and, and Gun, hi. And Fiona, I don't see Fiona. We've given Fiona a year off. She usually she usually chairs our conferences when we hold them in person, but um, we've we've taken control of it ourselves this year just to give her a rest and to hopefully uh, make it go as smoothly as possible. Um, brilliant. Oh, fantastic. I can see your slide on the oh, screen now. <laughs> yes, it's very if you good. Could go to slideshow mode and work through it. That would be fantastic. Wait. 
Right. And I just wanted to say one of the benefits of being online this year is that we get to meet you because we wanted to have you over to London or Birmingham or wherever we've been previously and you're always very busy so it's just really great to be able to catch you online. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Actually, I, I would love to come as, as you know and uh, <clears throat> I'm very grateful and honored that I can uh, be with you here and I'm re I really learned uh, from the lecture and uh, that I heard and uh, I'm impressed with the effort that you are putting together. So uh, you will be amused now because it's, you know, a very small country, uh, Slovenia, so the, the situation is, is very different. So thank you for this and for today I, I will touch the history a little bit and I will show you how we started and then developed and had some own data and the sweet era actually that is for us I, I think very very important. So the Slovenian childhood onset type 1 diabetes uh, was initiated in 1969. Uh, we understand that this is the second oldest national registry I think after Sweden but I may be wrong. And it was first presented at ISPAD in the late 70s by, by Cyril. And this is the first uh, public recognition of, of our registry, if you want. At that time, they didn't even say the whole country because it was one year after the Slovenian independence. However, we did send data to this Eurodia from the very from the very beginning. And here among many countries. It's actually only Austria and uh, Sweden, I understand, that they have a full registry around <laughs> early 90s. And we were also part of the Diamond. Uh, this was a World Health Organization through through Eurodiap and then, uh, uh, you know, also independently for some time. They were They were a little bit overlapping for some time. And here for the first time we are listed as a state. And then we published our own data very humbly. To be honest, this is Cyril for those of you that you don't remember him. I was at that time the mastermind of what we were doing and publishing. And then we went on. So the register initially it was a manual book that we took data out, became computerized and here Natasha that some of you may know actually participated. And this is the first, uh, it was an, a Eurodiap publication of Diabetologia that we participated and invited also the Tuzla region with us so that they, it was the first time that a Bosnian registry was, was uh, published. And then this very famous uh, Eurodiap almost conclusion paper where Slovenia is in as a whole nation with a with a increase in incidence with a central European region here with a comparable incidence to Austria, to Czech Republic and uh, to Northern Italy, although they don't have national data. Later on, we show that this increase in incidence is going up. So from three something to 4.3% and in our environment, as you will see, it's still rising. So this is the latest data. This is not uh, standardized. It's raw data. As you can see, as of last year, we are above 80 new cases for the country per year, which brings us closer to an incidence of 16 or even maybe 17 per 100,000 standardized population. And also this year, we are already at the number 43 and we are at the mid uh, you know, it's it's June. So another thing is that we have uh, our national registry A1C. We measure it four to seven times a year. It really depends now less because of the CGM. And uh, as you can see, it is dropping. However, we are not happy, as you will see very soon. We have data from A1C also from the 90s. I'm just showing the last 20 years of how of how it went and with this I would like to sh show you how we now look at the benchmarking in comparison we very much rely on the sweet benchmarking I know there are there are four centers from the UK that also 
participate. And I think it's a very good idea, despite the fact that you have your own network and your own database. Uh, for us now, our, our colleague Clemen is mostly doing it, and he also initiated the Time in Range initiative in Winsights with, and it is now the fourth year that we are collecting data. And we now actually in 2020, the amount of data increased considerably. Uh, so we have now more than 3,000 patients uh, inside the registry with the data. And also now the first paper will go out, the first analysis, and it's amazing actually. You will you will see soon the results. And this is the, the most important part. So this is the benchmarking all centers around 80,000 young people with diabetes. As you can see here, actually we are in the green, but we are far from happy. So we are not in target, which is seven here. We are below the median around 7.4 but we are really not happy. And also our distribution that was really nicely shown previously is wider that we wanted to see. So uh, we have work to do. This, is, this was, this was the, the, the electronic approximation and this is the measured A1C. As you can see, very comparable. And also this one is above 7%. So we are not uh, really completely happy with our with our outcomes. This is the the data on uh, continuous glucose monitoring all centers. As you can see in the SWE database, CGM is already above uh, here the percentage above 50% in the database, which is amazing because there are also centers from India inside big centers. So uh, probably if we would focus to the to the European Union and the United States, this number, this percentage would be considerably higher. And this is now uh, uh, the, the data for BMI, which I also believe is a benchmark measurement. As you can see here, we are in the low, low part of the, of the problem. Still 21% of people have BMI above 85th centile. So it's still a, still a concern that we try to address. This is the blood pressure and here we are actually quite quite above it's it's quite concerning and we are looking into it what what could be the reason why perhaps we use less uh, ACE inhibitors which is likely so it's a this year debate actually why we are so high and this of course is center specific analysis this is what you were showing for veils i have to say that slovenia is a single center experience so all people that, are, that have type 1 before below the age of 21 are in the registry. As you can see, the severe hypo went down and uh, this is the center is in red and the, the SWE database is in blue. And this is the DKA. We made a huge effort some years ago, but the DKA is rising recently, as you will see. Uh, actually, it was already published that the DKA goes up again in our center, which is terrible. Initial DKA, but not total DKA. Total DKA went down considerably. So it's just the presentation DKA that went up in the last two years. And this is the DKA uh, all over and the severe hypo in relation to the A1C. And as you can see here, the A1C, oh, this is our center here in green, seems to be stable just above seven. and the DKA and severe hypo went down with, with the exception of this rise here that we are quite unhappy to see. And it, it may be, it may, it may have been COVID related. And as you see here, actually, we don't see a drop anymore and we are extremely nervous and we'll work on this extensively actually to act, to improve because it, it really, it fits with the Swede, but it, it doesn't fit to our self image at all. So we need to, we need to do something. And here is the distribution that I mentioned previously. This is all people 0 to 21 for our center. And as you can see, actually, it, it seems that, you know, approximately half of people are green, but we are not happy. And particularly this group, which is the adolescent group, particularly 13, 14 girls, is of concern. And 5% of people above 10 is a huge concern for us. And we will have a specifically uh, designed group to address this. Two recent publications that I just want to, to draw your attention to. One is this Swede initiative that repeated 
the data from the uh, Huidore initiative more than, I think 20 years ago or maybe 15 years ago, the, lowers the, the lower the target of a specific center, the better the outcome. So the targets that centers have actually is, is, is crucial. And of course, we also want now to transfer this to the timing range targets that we almost exclusively use. A1C remains only for benchmarking and from SWE database, we don't use it anymore in our routine uh, daily work. And of course, this beautiful sweet publication showing the opposite. So if the United States deteriorated here, as you can see in all age groups uh, here, the, 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 the A1C decreased in the SWE database in the same comparable uh, uh, period, two periods of the analysis. And this was related to the use of technology which is, uh, and, and of course, Gun and, and others are co-authors of this report. So uh, let me propose to you a couple of conclusions, perhaps for discussion. We now have, starting as a manual booklet and a direct transfer for our electronic medical record in the University Children's Hospital to the Slovenian registry and again, automatically to the suite registry, so we cannot influence the data, basically. The data comes from the e e EMR directly into the registries. Uh, and then we have the yearly benchmarking, as I showed to you, and we discuss this internally with, with big attention, and we make yearly improvement plans, some of them successful, some of them not successful, unfortunately. And of course, we use this as an internal quality control inside the hospital and the country. Uh, with this, I thank you very much uh, for again for the kind invitation. I am sorry I, I can't be with you, but perhaps at some point I will. And this is my team. They have to work while I speak. And uh, again, if there are any questions, I will be happy to, to discuss with you. Thanks very much. So just a reminder to anyone who's listening, there's a chat function in the top right hand corner of your screen. So if you've got any questions for Professor Battalino, if you could type them in those there and then I'll push them live. Tade, you might not be able to see them if your presentation is there, but I'll read them out. Um, while we wait for questions to come in, are there any questions or comments from the panel? Remembering that you're on mute. <laughs> Okay, so the first question that's come in. I this is a good sign. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, we've got, is the time and range data directly extracted from the CGMs, is it raw data, or is it submitted by clinics? I think that's a really good question. I'm glad someone's asked that because we're frequently asked uh, that in the NPDA, will we be collecting time and range data? At the moment, it doesn't seem like a possibility for us, but yeah, really interested to, to know how you deal with that. So it, I, I think it is a possibility, it's just not a simple one. So, you know, we, we all use, as you do, for Libre, we use the LibreView, and with LibreView, there is a button that says export. And you can export data as a CVS, so as an Excel table. So you basically can save raw data, and this is what we are doing. And we're also submitting them the raw data to the suite database. And this was the consensus inside the suite. So yes, we export raw data and transmit them to the suite. However, we asked all three platforms, so the, the LibreView, the Clarity, and the CareLink, to automize this so that we could get automatically CVS files to our electronic medical record and we were, or, or, or to the registry, whichever they prefer, and we were so far unable to do this. So they say it's too dangerous, whatever. So we have to actually manually transfer raw data into the registry in order to be able to analyze them and then transfer the data to whatever, either a study or the suite registry. 
and please help. I mean, British are much stronger than than us. So press on 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 Abbott and and Dexcom and and Medtronic to enable us to directly import raw data into the registries because it's a, it's it will simplify our work enormously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, um, I don't see any more questions coming in from the chat. Um, I wonder if we should move on to Gun's presentation. Um, Thank you so much, Tade. There was so much to digest in there. It's really great to have those international comparisons and to see your national journey uh, in in relation to ours. And I suppose the Swedish one that we've we've that we're, we're quite familiar with by this point. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. OK, so this is a nervous moment for me as I attempt to load Gun's slides. Let me see. Where is it? Ah, here we go. Right, that should be up on your screens now. So it is a pleasure for me to introduce, reintroduce uh, Gunther Sander, who was uh, at our last conference in January in London 2020. And we don't typically invite speakers back the year immediately after their presentation. But Gunz was so important. Um, I think the the phrase that, that really stuck in my memory from Gunn's presentation last year was when she said that her team were astonished and ashamed when they identified the HS, the HbA1c gap between her most deprived uh, caseload and those from the least deprived areas. And I just thought that really contrasted with with our attitudes. I think we we're really resigned in some cases to this persistent gap. Um, and so, yeah, we were really inspired to hear how Gunn's Clinic had closed the gap between those patients in two years. And we just really wanted a bit more detail. Um, so we've invited Gun back to tell us in a bit more detail how how she and her team did it. So welcome, welcome back, Gun. Um, can you see your slide uh, on the screen? I think I think it's there. Yeah. Where's Gun gone? Oh, she's coming back in. <laughs> Sorry, Holly, it's Rob. Could you just a full screen on that? Because I can see the outline of the PowerPoint. But might just be my screen. Okay. Well, I can see Gun's back. Gun, you're on mute right now. If you could take off the mute, the mute button, that'd be fantastic. Oh, struggling. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah, you're back. Here you go. Oh, thank you. I don't know somehow. I'm sorry for this. That's okay. okay. Uh, thank you for for inviting me once again. I, I visited your nice meeting last year, yes, you know, and uh, that was in real life. And actually, that was the last conference I could attend before the pandemic situation came. So I was asked to to talk about a specific project where, that we have had in in Gothenburg, Sweden, actually uh, some years ago now, and it was about uh, minority groups uh, and the than the issue to, to take care of those kids. Next uh, slide, please. Nothing relevant to disclose. And this is about the Angered project. Next slide, please. Actually, I presented the idea of this project already 10 years ago at the ISPAD meeting in Miami. Um, but then it was yeah, kind of a teaser and um, then it the project went on. So next slide. 
The project was called Organizing Person-Centered Care in Pediatric Diabetes, Communication, Decision-Making, Ethics and Health. And it all started by, by my astonished feeling and realization that our immigrant children at our uh, outpatient clinic in Gothenburg did much worse regarding to HbA1c than the Swedish children and, and it was totally unacceptable even if I know of course that it is um, presented from many sites all over the world but I was not happy to see it at my clinic so to speak and as a coincidence um, the, the you know, University of Gothenburg just had organized a new department calling, called the Gothenburg Person Center Care um, unit or something like that and got quite a lot of money so I sent in a proposal to get this um, project um, financed and we got quite a lot of money so that was nice and um, I, I asked uh, some leading um, researchers from the university in a holistic way to, to focus on this very problem on the immigrant children's worse outcome. So, for example, a very well reputed, well, very well known professor in um, philosophy in Gothenburg, Christian Munte, and a professor of um, public health and community medicine joined us, as well, for example, a senior lecturer from the business administration and a senior lecturer and associate professor from the um, Department of Psychology. So next slide, please. So the background to the project is the knowledge that teenagers who belong to an underprivileged ethnic minority group are often less successful in, in managing their self-care of diabetes type 1. And that effective support for self-care to adolescents with diabetes demands that the care team is able to establish a dialogue with each young person that is well adjusted to their conceptions, attitudes and context. Next slide, please. So if I start with the aim of the study was to provide knowledge that could be applied to improve the organization and performance of pediatric diabetes care of teenagers with type 1 diabetes and a non-Swedish background through improved person-centeredness of care. And this study involves two pediatric diabetes outpatient clinics in Gothenburg. And um, the one, um, the first one is of course the university clinic, uh, which was the only one at that time and then we established uh, during the study um, a smaller outpatient clinic uh, in a residential area with many ethnic minorities mainly coming from Somalia and from Iran and Iraq and the Middle East region of the world. So I can I can mention that 10 years ago, as Justin said, the mean value in Sweden by then was around 60 millimole per mole. And I think these um, adolescents, they, they had around 68, 70 millimole per mole um, as a mean or medium value, which was shocking. Next slide, please. So we decided in the project uh, steering committee to, to work in five work packages um, and using the, the concepts and the, the knowledge from each of the professional researchers in the group. So the first work package was about the adolescents' concepts of risk, of the disease and of self-care. So it started uh, with a systematic literature review on adolescents' risk perceptions and health behavior. And then we went on with interviews with, in a kind of pilot study with 12 adolescents with type 1 diabetes and a non-Swedish background. And the interviews were about their disease, how they looked upon their self-care, social situation, and the care and support from their caregiving organizations. And that was, um, of course, by then only the university clinic. And then a study went on how the phenomena are identified in A and B 
were mirrored and dealt with in patient consultations with our pediatric diabetologists and diabetes nurses. So next slide. So how did we do that? We actually video recorded uh, quite a lot of outpatient clinic meetings, both with the immigrant uh, adolescents, but also with the Swedish adolescents. And then we made a study on uh, the adolescents diabetes care meetings to acquire knowledge of the quality of communication with these patients and to relate this knowledge to the concept of PCC, that is person-centered care. And that was an experience, of course, as I was the project leader, I was not videotaped. My, my, my patient meetings were not video recorded, but I saw my, my, um, my colleagues and that was an experience to look upon these, these videotaped outpatient meetings together with a professor of, of um, philosophy, et cetera, et cetera, and, and look upon the care with their eyes, so to speak. It was really an experience. So then when we went on, all these work packages took place uh, more or less in parallel. In work package three, we made interviews with the care team professionals to describe and analyze their perceptions and practices regarding the children, as well as the rational or the actual organization of care as implemented in, for example, care meetings. So it was a trained uh, interviewer, not really connected to the project in other ways that, that had um, uh, not videotaped, but video recorded interviews with the team professionals. And then it was transcribed, of course, so we couldn't make any conclusions out of the uh, interviews. Next, please. And here comes the, the professor of philosophy with ethical aspects on shared decision making. Um, and the study of clinical consultations with adolescents, or again, the video recorded, um, both, um, do you say video recorded when you mean both the, the film and the voices? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was both. Uh, and then uh, he and the group around him um, looked at those tapes and, and um, studied how the shared decision making was applied, how the patient narratives were used in the planning of the care, and to what extent ethical or other problems arose in the relation to this. Next, please. And finally, we, of course, wanted to feedback to the members of the professional diabetes teams, both the university team and the one in the out uh, in the region with the immigrant um, people, um, how both teams could learn from the results of the project. So we developed and applied a methodology for feedback and learning from these results and in the participate in pediatric diabetes teams. And we thought the methodology should support the acknowledgement of identified needs that we had found and support the development of improved strategies uh, with regard especially to communication and interaction with the patients to strengthen their self-care ability. And but the intervention should be of that intensity and character that was acceptable for the teams and feasible with the available resources. We don't, we didn't want the teams to to be ashamed what they had done before, so to speak, but be proud to to go any further with our work with the with the adolescents. So next. So this is the forest just behind my house. Yes, uh, the work pack package one um, was the literature review and uh, that was dealing with the risk perceptions of risk behavior with long-term health consequences of the disease. And as we know, it's many, many factors that are uh, contributing to this risk perception and risk behavior 
of course, demographic uh, factors as age and gender, but also personality and attitudes and peers that we could classify into different undergroups. And um, if the adolescent had close experience of negative health effect that was in the literature close, closely connected to the risk perception of risk behavior. And then, of course, as always, the socioeconomic situation and, um, and knowledge and um, things like that. So that was from the literature. And then we went on. Next slide. And from the experience in our project, um, the, the researchers uh, surrounding me, so to speak, they said that the caregivers, the team's focus on HbA1c levels created very much anxiety in relation to the clinic visits, specifically among the non-adherent group. And this provided much negative feedback on their ability for and access of self-care. So it was more HbA1c focus than we perhaps had thought it was during those dialogues with adolescents. But from their side, the pediatric diabetologist was perceived as the mayor pe person of the team, and they stressed that a long-term relationship was very important. The nurses, according to these immigrant uh, adolescents, they, they relieved anxiety. They were nice and uh, talked to them um, softly and, and were smiling and they described that the nurses were really good people at the outpatient clinic. And a bit sadly, they thought that the psychologists, social workers and dietitians were perceived to be consulted when there were real problems. So they didn't really count them into the diabetes team, which was kind of a disappointment to realize. Next slide, please. And we found that adolescents who had integrated their disease as part of their personal prerequisites, they seemed to be more successful with self-care. Uh, so helping the adolescents to reach this is then an essential task for the caregivers. Those who not, were not afraid to tell their peers, for example, that they had diabetes and, and were not afraid of the word diabetes, for example, they were more successful than those who had to hide it from, from the surrounding people. And the support from significant others, from, for example, family members was important, but improved quality of such support may help the adolescents towards integration of the disease and assuming responsibility for the care. For example, there were mothers and perhaps fathers who told their, their adolescent um, child that um, this disease, this disease uh, might probably be cured within five years or so, so it's not so important that you, you follow the, the rules how to treat yourself. Etc. Etc. And that was, of course, a very negative um, message for them. Next, please. Regarding the organization, uh, it, it's of course not sufficient to express uh, person-centered values in order to create a person-centered care process or practice. It, it, it has to be more than so. Uh, for example, facilitating long-term relationships with patients and their families is vital for the delivery of person-centered pediatric diabetes care. And uh, facilitating the multi-professional teamwork is highly important, as well as avoiding organizing the care according to traditional health care paradigms. And, and that is very obvious uh, when caring for these immigrant adolescents. And of course, a good documentation is always essential. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a graph that we presented in one of the publications from this study, um, describing the situation of the child on a micro, meso and macro level. And um, it's not a very rocket science, perhaps, but um, the, the individual in the middle is, of course, um, influenced by both more the personality, 
more individual things like the personality and the striving for normality and the attitude to the disease, risk-taking behavior, yeah, integrity, forgetfulness, um, hope, and the individual is always um, surrounded by friends and the school staff and diabetes team, as well as the family, of course, which is, of course, extremely essential. And all around is the diabetes discourse from society and the culture and the school organization. Everything is, is um, um, influence, making, makes an influence on the adolescent and, and the self-care possibility. Next slide, please. So the results uh, regarding ethical aspects on shared decision making. Um, we, th we think that um, we have to realize valuable objectives, but also imply ethical issues that need to be managed in the impl implementation of PCC in patient consultations. And standard PCC models, um, standard uh, regarding adult person-centered care models and ideas, generally ignore important ethical dimensions with regard to the adolescent patient's capacity to realize agreed self-care plans, um, which are to be implemented outside of the structured PCC consultation situation. And that is uh, crucial for long-term autonomy, adherence and health. So we have to, we have to consider things like the teenager think th thoughts about what would I want to do and wish I did at the best of times, for example, and what is best for me right now and what is, what is rational and acceptable for a kind of person like me. Uh, many of them, they regarded themselves as careless and incapable and forgetful, etc., etc. So we can't ask a shared decision making from a adolescent that is not really mature to make those decisions uh, by him or herself. Next slide, please. Uh, so it's critical to assess and systematically support the patient's decision competence in consultations meetings and in the daily self-care. And um, sadly enough, this was not, according to the videotaped um, patient meetings, not performed systematically at our clinic. And often um, it was used in ways that imply risk of negative side effects that is, for example, decreased preparedness of patients to receive counsel or undercut rather than promote patient decision competence through negative emotional effects such as fear. So we stress a need to go from cross-examination to consultation to listen more and tell less, invite and support the patient in the analysis of problems, empower, help patients identify and release sources of anxiety. And this is perhaps not big news, but anyway, it was obvious that we had to work with those processes. Next slide, please. So the feedback uh, to professional diabetes team members and learning from results, um, we uh, designed a dialogue-based procedure for both reflective communication between researchers and pediatric diabetes healthcare teams regarding these study results, and also reflective communication within healthcare teams about the research findings. And then we finally tried to implement these procedures through a number of workshops at the, both of the participating pediatric diabetes clinics and we were trying to focus a few themes at a time. Next. What about then the, the project conclusion regarding metabolic control? We could conclude, luckily, that after two years within the project, uh, it was possible for the immigrant children and adolescents to reach the same low mean HbA1c level as the non-immigrant children at our clinic. 
So they went down within two years to the same, um, which then I think was 58 or something millimole per mole. Now we have 52 as a mean value at our clinic, but this was some years ago. But to a higher mon monetary cost because of more time and resources spent, it was more diabetes team staff per individual and family. And we always had interpreters involved in the project uh, in families that needed it. But looking at the health economy assessment, it is definitely worth the money in the long run, as uh, at least uh, Swedish health uh, economy researchers account with 80 to 85 percent of the societal cost for diabetes care is about handling long term complications of the disease. So next. And the strength with the, this uh, new uh, project clinic in Angered um, was the nearby staff of well-educated diabetes team professionals, and they were working in an explicit uh, person and family centered way, uh, facilitating both fast contact on a daily basis if needed, with the team when needed and optimal treatment. A close co-working procedure with school, social services, Department of Neuropsychiatry was built up and a family individual's contact with the same pediatric diabetologist and diabetes nurse was assured as well as repeated home and school visits by the team when needed. So these resources aren't there really at the, our ordinary clinic to, to see the families that often and even go to the schools, go to the uh, social services with them, etc. And quite a lot of telephone contact um, as a complement to ordinary meetings. And all of them that wished to get it got um, uh, an insulin pump and CGM. And this was 10 years ago when we started the project. So at that time, not all of our patients had CGM. Nowadays, 95%, that is all of them that want to have one, get one. But at that time, it was not so, uh, so um, uh, ah, not all of them had it. And we also offered in the project evening outpatient clinic visits to, to make it easier for the families to show up. So next slide, please. Yes, this, we have six publications on this um, project. And uh, I don't know the time for me. How am I late or am I? You're great. Ah, oh, thank you. Can, can I show the next slide? Of course. Um, this work was supported by the Center for Person Center Care at University of Gothenburg, but also from the Swedish government's grant for strategic, strategic research areas. And um, yes, thank you for your attention. I want to say one thing more, but if there are any questions on the project, I'll be happy to answer. OK, there's always a little delay between us and the attendees. Um, let's have a look. Oh, a couple have come through. So the first question is, what is the duration of the appointment in your practice? And did you alter this at all in your study? Uh, the ordinary time is 45 minutes. Um, we, we um, except on the first year when we see our patient more often, we offer them 45 minutes with the pediatric diabetologist. And we, they always see the nurse before or after the um, diabetologist. So all together it's one, one hour, four times a year and more often within the first year. And the other question was, I missed that. You said once, said something else. Uh, yeah, it was, was, what is the duration of the appointment in your practice and did you alter it at all in your study? Uh, because the clinician said that they find the current 30 minutes is often too short, especially with adolescents, increased technology and if there are any language barriers. Yeah, I mean, 
to me, 30 minutes is much uh, too, too, too little. <laughs> it's too little time for, to spend. Yeah. We have another comment, um, which I'm sure is shared by many, which is, I like your description of mean HbA1c of 68 millimole per mole being shocking. And we all have a long way to go until we're equally as shocked, but we're on the right track with that and we will get there. Yes. Yeah, and you have the nice curve that that Justin showed. So I think you are on the wrong, on the right, sorry, <laughs> the right track, of course. Um, I don't know if all the technology is reimbursed in in England and Welsh, uh, Wales, is it? Because we have, we are lucky to get it totally reimbursed. So that's why we can, we don't have to consider the family economy, for example, uh, when putting a pump and a CGM. And I think that's very important, of course. And the, that we develop a cultural competence uh, as we try to do in this project, I think that's essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really pleased to report that um, we're aware of two really big uh, NIHR funding applications that have gone in at the moment to look at barriers accessing tech in deprived and minority ethnic communities and also to address the H HbA1c gap because clearly the research that you did was of a very high quality multidisciplinary that's not that's not cheap it's not something we could do quickly um, so really really pleased to report that we'll be supporting uh, those funding applications with data as appropriate because we absolutely have to get to where you are and it's brilliant to have you as an example showing that it absolutely can be done so thank you so much for your time. It's just lovely to see you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Justin's got a question, but he's on mute. There's always one. <laughs> and every week he's still on mute, Justin. <laughs> you have to speak out. Still on mute. Put it in the chat. You're still on mute, Justin. <laughs> the technique is not very easy to handle. It's not, is it? We're still not used That's to it. That's why I asked you to, to share my... <laughs> <laughs> can I yeah, ask sorry. something? No, I can hear you. No, no, it was today. <laughs> can I can I ask Gun something? It's today. Oh, Absolutely. Yes, yes, you know today. You know how to use your microphone. <laughs> I I I'm trying to to turn the camera on. Also, it, it really doesn't re, uh, respond to the buttons. Don't. Gun, <laughs> who who pays for visits longer than thirty minutes? Do you get reimbursement for this? Because I agree, it's it's the crucial question. Can we get enough time for those? Because we also designed a plan for those that really don't do well, but we have no reimbursement for it. So we have to finance it from our patient association, basically. Uh, that's To me, that sounds very strange. I mean, we don't have to declare to anyone uh, I mean, if we want to put one and a half an hour on, on the one family, no, nobody cares, so to speak. As long as we produce nice uh, figures uh, and, and the patients and the families are happy. You know, we have 550 patients and families around that at uh, our clinic. And um, of course, we uh, all of them get 45 minutes and some of them get more. Thank you very much. I will quote you with my insurance system. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Gunn, I, I also know you wanted to promote uh, submissions to your journal, so I'll include a link with that to the feedback form to all of the attendees of the conference, if that's OK. Did, did you want to mention anything while you've got them as a captive audience? Yes. Uh, can, can you put the slide on or? Uh, I'll try. Yeah. yeah, I was invited to be the guest uh, editor for Nutrients, which is a quite well known um, um, paper for for um, nutrition, and I actually accepted. Uh, and um, so uh, that's why I want to invite you to send a nice manuscript to Nutrients. Um, the deadline in the middle of October, 10th of October, actually. Um, it's hard to find it now. It is hard to find it. <laughs> oh, sorry, I came out. Um, yeah, yeah, I've loaded the next one up instead now, but I promise I will forward it. Yeah, you can do that, please, because uh, we will be happy to get nice manuscripts on, 
on pediatric. It will be a special issue on pediatric diabetes. That's why um, I'm Thank asking you. you to to deliver your manuscripts to me <laughs> and to the paper. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, Gun. Hope to see you again. Yeah, bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you. OK, so our next speaker uh, is Dr. Ruben Willemson from Bart's Health. And we approached um, we approached the Royal London specifically because I was putting some data together the other day for NHS England and they were looking at uh, which centres had the highest tech use in England and I put together a list and I saw the Royal London right at the top of it um, and I looked at their deprivation profile and it's very dramatic. Um, the Royal London it's just down the road from me actually I'm in Hackney so I know um, that it's a very diverse and challenging population and yet the outcomes of this team have been quite astonishing over the last few years. So um, following Gunn's presentation we thought it would be really appropriate to invite them to tell us a little bit about how they're managing. Um, so Ruben I see you there, thank you so much for joining today. Are you going to try and load your slides or do you want me to do it? Um, I'm trying, just give me another second. <laughs> Don't worry if it's not if it's not. Yeah, I've got them to have disappeared from my. Um, <laughs> it's temperamentally. I can it? see my um, slides, but I can't um, get them up for some reason. Shall I have a go? Yes, please. OK. Now, I think you can see that, can you? Yeah, brilliant. Success. Hurrah. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, so, to move on. Yeah, <laughs> so right, thank you um, for the invitation. Um, so next slide. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just tell a little bit about where we are and then go through our outcomes. Uh, and then um, I've, I've tried to sort of put something together about what we think is important to do because uh, obviously there's many, many different things a diabetes team does to achieve certain outcomes and it's always difficult to say what um, is, it's probably not one main thing but man, many different things but I've kind of tried to come up with a few things. Um, so I work at the Royal London Children's Hospital and um, so this is a map of London and this is where we are. So almost right in the middle uh, and so, so most of our local uh, patients are from where you can see the stars. Uh, so this is Hackney, this is Tower Hamlets uh, and then kind of more north here, Stamford Hill. Um, next slide. And we are one of three hospitals in uh, Vart Health NHS Trust uh, and we work very closely together. Um, so the other two hospitals are Ribs Cross, which is a bit more sort of in the northeast, and Newham Hospital, which is further uh, field east. Next slide. So just to sort of show uh, some features of our caseload. Um, so we have um, about 76% uh, of our patients are type 1. Uh, so these are data from the 2018-2019 uh, NPDA audits. Uh, we have quite a large percentage of patients with type 2 diabetes and this is still on the rise. So in the sort of latest NPDA this has come up to 11%. Uh, and then we've got quite a few sort of other diabetes. So this the CF diabetes ones is quite a large group and um, then we've also got some genetic forms of diabetes and secondary diabetes and so on. 
Uh, and in the graph below that, you see the uh, deprivation profile of our unit as compared to uh, London and uh, the rest of England and Wales. So we are the blue bars, and as you can see, the vast majority of our patients are in the most deprived and second most deprived uh, quintile. Next slide. Uh, in terms of ethnicity, so we, we are a very multi-ethnic cohort, uh, which you can see on this slide, again, as compared to London and England and Wales. Um, so we've got quite a sort of large proportion of Asian uh, ethnicity and black uh, and lots of sort of other um, uh, uh, mixes. Next slide. I sometimes think pictures say more than uh, words, so I just put a few in here. So the, the top left one is something I see every day when I get to work and get out of the tube at Whitechapel Station. So there's like a marker there and it's like a, a mix of all kind of different ethnicities and uh, people. Uh, and in the back there, I'm not sure whether you can see it, you can see the gherkin, which we're very close to. Um, so we're also close to Brick Lane, which is famous for the, all the Indian curries. Um, so the more our Hackney area has got quite a large proportion of uh, Black and Caribbean um, ethnicity. Uh, if we look to the other side of the hospital, we can see Can Canary Wharf in the distance. Uh, and we also have some patients of the Orthodox Jewish uh, community as part of our caseloads. Next slide. So what about our HA1C? So here you see the HA1C over the last few years. Um, and so very pleased to see that sort of in line with the national trend, this has gradually come down. Um, and uh, we were, um, so this is the unadjusted median HA1C, and we were sort of in the orange year 1819 at 59.5. And below that you see the distribution uh, so we have lower percentages in the high HA1C groups and higher percentages in the lower A1C groups. Next slide. And these are those funnel plots everyone is quite familiar with. You get in the NPDA report. Uh, so this is the adjusted mean HA1C where we were a positive outlier. And below that, the adjusted percentage of children with an A1C less than 58. Uh, where we were um, right there at the top. Next slide. And this is the adjusted percentage of children with a high A1C, uh, where you can see ourselves there just on that line. Okay, and um, in terms of use of technology, so a few of these graphs. Uh, so in the 1819 NPDA, we had about 50% of our patients on pumps, uh, but that has increased in the sort of recent um, in the year thereafter to about 59%. And in the graph below, you see the median A1C per treatment regimen, and you can see that our pump users have uh, better HA1Cs than the MDIs, and it's also slightly better than uh, London and England and Wales. In terms of CGM, so we were actually a bit under um, the average uh, in uh, the 1819 MPDA, uh, but this has changed quite a lot recently, uh, quite dramatically actually. So in the 1920 MPDA, uh, this is now about 30%. Next slide. Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to share a bit about sort of our local uh, pediatric diabetes journey. Um, so here in this graph, you see the HA1C over the years of the three different hospitals in our trust um, from 2013 sort of up to now. And uh, so back in 2013, uh, the sites worked sort of uh, in isolation and as you can see there was quite a lot of inequity of care with huge variation in the HA1C and there was also quite a large variation in, in practice. 
Um, and so from 2013, we started to work more together. Uh, so our pediatric diabetes nurses and dietitians, they became all one team and worked across different sites. Uh, and uh, in 2015, uh, we implemented a um, nurse and dietitian led high HA1C clinic. Um, and we've sort of worked very hard to standardize care and the cross-site working has helped with that um, and to do things um, uh, in the same way uh, and to treat to target. Next slide. So as part of that, um, um, we've had away days and um, we were also encouraged to come up with a mission statement and so here are just some pictures of those. Um, so the mission statement, we've really had uh, quite a few goes at. So on the left, you see the sort of big chart where we sort of tried to come up with something which everyone was happy with. It was actually quite difficult and uh, we didn't quite reach a conclusion um, initially. But then in the second away day, we did uh, and we've just come up with our mission statement, which should be helping all children and young people with diabetes in East London to lead a healthy, happy life. Next slide. So as many other units, we also participated in the uh, RCPCHQI project. Um, and because we were, we were quite a big team, uh, we sort of divided in uh, different working groups. Um, so we've had five projects, which you can see in the green here, and they were all meant to, to work towards the same goal uh, to achieve an uh, HA1C of less than 48, 12 months post-diagnosis in our newly diagnosed. Uh, so I haven't got time to go into all of this in detail, but we've had a work stream about uh, our type 1 patients in the first year of diagnosis, and came up with a newly diagnosed booklet and pathway. Uh, because of our growing number of type 2 patients, we've also focused on that and come up with a pathway and we now got specialist pediatric type 2 diabetes clinics. Uh, there was another group focusing on downloading onto Dicent from diagnosis um, and another group on standardising uh, the key care processes and also increasing our user engagement. Next slide. So, so what, what do we believe in? So I think one of the most important things is probably that as a team um, you have a consistency of a message and that you all sing from the same hymn sheets and, and it's often sort of look quite simple things I think which, which you'd be surprised of how, how different it is uh, people can talk about it. So example things like about well, what glucose level do you give a correction uh, and what sort of do you aim for and uh, we're putting a lot of effort in sort of making sure that everyone um, is saying the same and I, I do believe that that really sort of helps in supporting our patients to achieve uh, better outcomes. Um, in terms of te technology, um, so we've, we've got a guideline for insulin pump treatment and eligibility and uh, the deprivation level and ethnicity or language skills, they are not part of those criteria. Um, the other thing I think is quite important to get right from the beginning. Um, so we admit all our newly diagnosed patients regardless of the type, age or any other factors. Uh, there's actually no fixed duration of the admission, uh, but the discharge depends on the family achieving um, competencies. Uh, before COVID, we used to do a phased discharge where uh, towards the end of the admission, patients were allowed some time off the ward to have like a meal at home or an overnight stay, uh, while we would still sort of keep the bed and uh, would be able to provide uh, that support. Uh, before they were eventually uh, discharged uh, home. And we used to start every child less than five years of age on a pump straight from diagnosis as an inpatient. And we've changed that over the last couple of years or last year or so to patients uh, less than nine years of age. 
Next slide. So I thought it would also be quite nice to share a case story. Um, um, so this was a two-year-old boy with a, um, with a twin brother. Uh, they were diagnosed um, elsewhere. Uh, so, so only one of the two uh, developed diabetes. Uh, and it was started on MDI in another hospital. And then after that, there was a history of domestic violence uh, where the mother had to move into a refuge and that was in our local area. Uh, and she had very limited social support. Um, she was Albanian and uh, required an interpreter for um, communication. Um, so initially he was on MDI and but had very low insulin requirements. So it was very difficult to manage because if you gave him half a unit more, he got hypos and if you gave him half a unit less, he had very high glucose levels. Uh, so we really felt um, like all our other patients for this age, he should be on a pump and we organised an admission for a pump start. Uh, and then on top of that, he was also found to have a positive CDX screen. So this was quite difficult to organise because because there was a twin brother and very limited social support. Uh, so we actually ended up admitting the twin brother as well, and very kindly the ward um, accommodated that. Uh, we needed to organise interpreters uh, to do all the education, uh, and he was actually admitted for 24 days uh, to get all of this done, but also had an endoscopy in the same admission. Um, and he's currently doing very well. Um, he's very proud of his pump and his last H1C was 54. But there's still more work which we have to do. And um, I'm very, um, I have to thank Nikki Moore, who is our lead diabetes nurse for this. So she did a project as part of her uh, master's in pediatric diabetes. Uh, looking at uh, glycemic outcomes for children and young people with type 1 diabetes whose families need interpreter support. Uh, so we divided the patients into three groups, one where they absolutely needed an interpreter, uh, the second group where they uh, did not need an interpreter but were also not quite fluent in English, uh, and the third group, which were fluent English speaking, either because it was their native language or as a second language. And the parameters that were studied were age, HA1C, insulin regime, and the number of contacts uh, across these three different groups. Next slide. Um, so, so we had identified in total 32 different languages, which were spoken in our cohort as the main language. Uh, and this was across 392 participants. Uh, so it was a, a mix of all kinds of things, uh, but sort of the most common language in the group that needed interpreter support, so that's group one, uh, was Bengali and Sileti uh, at 30%. Slight. So these are the outcomes of that. Um, so here you see the three different groups, group one needing interpreter, group two the middle one and group three fluent in English. Um, so the age was younger in, in the group requiring interpreter support. Uh, There's no difference in sex uh, and quite shockingly we found that only 18% of the group requiring interpreter support were on pumps, uh, whereas in the other groups this was about 50%. Uh, also, we found their HA1C was significantly higher uh, and there was no difference in the number of uh, contacts. Next slide. Um, so, yes, yeah, so coming towards the conclusion. So, um, obviously, I mean, we are happy with our outcomes, but there's still lots of things, more things we need to work on. Um, so, in, in terms of the ongoing challenges we now have is that there's currently more choice about pumps and sensors and it can be quite difficult to decide for newly diagnosed families uh, what, what to start on from diagnosis. Um, so as, as Nikki's study has indicated, there's still a lot of inequality related to language. And the other thing which we've noticed during uh, the COVID pandemic is that 
there's also quite a lot of digital inequality because like many other units we had to um, move towards telephone clinics and asking patients to download their meters at home and there were sort of quite a lot of families which didn't have any computers at home or they didn't have any internet um, and obviously that also impacts on um, yeah, how well we could support them during that time. Uh, so we were able to get some laptops through charity for some uh, patients, but this is still uh, quite an important issue, I think. Uh, and so the moving forward, what we want to do is now we've recovered from COVID, sort of pick up the, all the projects, quality improvement things we were working on. Uh, We've said as a team we really want to work to reducing the health inequality and digital inequality uh, further. So one of the things we've done is we've employed a family support worker who um, can speak Bengali and, um, and, and she's been really useful for um, some of our patients with um, difficulties with language and also um, social uh, difficulties, refugees and things like that. Um, we've also managed to get some funding for youth workers through an STP um, wider project, um, but that's kind of coincided with the COVID pandemic, which then made it very difficult for them to actually meet people face to face. Uh, but now we are able to, um, yeah, to be able to meet more in person. Uh, we hope to pick this up uh, further again. Next slide. So thanks for listening. Um, so I want to thank my the whole team. Um, uh, and um, if there's any questions, happy to answer them. Let's see. OK, so I've got a question here. For how long do you admit patients on average at diagnosis? Do you normally admit patients for pump starts? And if so, how is that going to be beneficial? Um, so the average duration of the newly diagnosed admission is around seven days. Uh, but as I said, there's no, we don't have a fixed duration of it. It really depends uh, on the family and how quickly they achieve their competencies. But on average, it's seven days. Uh, and in terms of, of pump starts, we would, so, so if they're not newly diagnosed, we would not normally admit them. Uh, but the case story I um, showed was felt it was going to be very difficult to do this on an outpatient basis. So that's why uh, we've done that for some cases where we felt uh, that was better. OK, and someone else has asked, are your inpatient ward staff pump trained and able to support patients on pumps from diagnosis? How do you manage long hospital stays in the context of bed pressures? Yeah, <laughs> so, so yeah, so we do provide regular training to the ward staff um, and um, so, so they're used to deal with children on insulin pumps and uh, they can um, calf count as well. Um, so that works quite well. Um, there's still Yes, it's still a little bit of a struggle to get as many people to attend these uh, war training days, but um, yeah, we yeah. very much encourage that. Um, and the nurses every now and then also do sort of some more sort of bite-sized education for the ward staff on the on the ward um, for those that haven't been able to uh, attend the training days. Um, and, and what was the second question again? How do you manage long hospital stays in the context of bed pressures? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, yeah, we we seem to be able to get away with that. Um, so we are not uh, being pressured by management to discharge patients uh, with diabetes. Um, and I think I think there is this realization uh, which uh, that yeah, that this is this is just really important. Um, because they're going to have diabetes for the rest of their lives and we feel it's really important to do things right from the beginning. Um, so um, yeah, that seems to work well um, in our unit.
Amazing. Well, I hope you enjoyed doing that presentation because it was excellent. I suspect you're going to be invited to do a lot more similar presentations to inspire other teams and demonstrate what is possible with the right team approach and with the right institutional support, because that is truly fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so our next presentation is um, something that we really had to include as part of the programme during this strange pandemic year or phase of diabetes care and it is Anita are you here I don't see your face or your microphone but I do have your slides so I'm going to load them now uh, we've got Anita England who will be sharing with us her team's in Cornwall's experience of drive through clinics. Anita, are you still there? Where have you gone? Give it a minute. Oh, there you are. Yes, um, we can't hear you though, Anita. <laughs> Perhaps if you unplug your headset, because I can see that you're unmuted on the computer. What about now? Oh, yes. That's oh, brilliant. Yeah. That's okay. Brilliant. Okay. 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 That's brilliant. So let me know when you want me to move on to the next slide. Fine. Um, hello, my name's Anita England and I'm the lead um, paediatric diabetes nurse in Cornwall for Cornwall's and the Isles of City. And um, I've been asked to speak um, about the, our drive through DCA clinics because we haven't been able to do face to face clinics. Um, so we thought we'd try and do something. So next slide, Holly. So unfortunately, as I said, we're unable to do face to face clinics. And as we're a DGH, um, we have got one main hospital at Royal Cornwall Hospital and West Cornwall Hospital. But the other hospitals where we do clinics um, are all um, owned by uh, by community health. So they've actually said that um, even now we're still not allowed to do face to face clinics. So we've been doing virtual clinics. And if you look at the, our geography, um, we've got quite a large geography and we go to up to um, Bude um, at the top there. At, so North Cornwall, um, over to Launceston, which is, um, well, mid Cornwall, and then to Lou. So we have got quite a good, um, like a large geography to try and cover. So we've been doing virtual clinics um, using Attend Anywhere our teams, but it hasn't always been successful. Um, and we've had to uh, do telephone contacts sometimes. So the rationale, so the next um, slide, Holly. So the rationale was to get the children to have the HbA1c taken as BPT and then PDA. But because we haven't been able to see them, um, we've been requesting that the children go to the GP for a venous sample and request the GP achieves, achieves the height, weight and blood pressure. Um, but we do realise that this gives extra work for the GP, GPs whilst in this pandemic. Um, and also as well, I think it's good for the children to demonstrate that they're working really hard because we are still asking them to download regularly. And if they haven't got the clinic, they can't see what their hard work has achieved really. So this was the rationale for why we thought um, we could do um, some a HBOC clinic. Next. So our PDSNs were really frustrated because um, they haven't been able to see our little humans in person and um, virtual clinic. You don't see the whole picture really. So it was the push by our PDSNs that we wanted to, um, to do this um, virtual clinic to do this DCA drive through. Um, we did have to consider um, realistically 
that we could only use one base, which was Trelisk um, in Truro. So, and we wouldn't be able to use bases around um, all the different areas where we do clinics. We did look into it, but it was quite difficult and we weren't, we were refused quite a lot of places. So we decided that we would go for Trelisk as a, you know, as a, um, a starting point. Um, the travel distance, as you can see, could be a round trip between 34 to 65 miles and an hour or an hour and a half uh, travel for some of, some of our patients who are in the, the, the further parts of um, Cornwall. The invite was definitely not compulsory due to the fact that we had a lot of poverty and deprivation. And what we didn't want we've, um, is to people to come to us for six and a half minutes and then have to drive back for an hour and a half. And we were a bit sceptical, first of all, to see if actually we would be able to, if anybody would actually turn up. But we thought, let's try it. The trust were insistent that we were ensured safety. So we used full PPE and we had to do lots of risk assessments and we had to get um, sign off by the, the managers of the hospital to say that everything was safe for us to do so. And also as well, we had to um, order all the, the things that we haven't had to. So DCA packs we had to order that we hadn't been doing whilst in the pandemic and not doing um, HbA1cs. Next, next slide, Holly. So what we thought we'd do is as an initial one, we do a morning session with two nurses and two DCAs all set up. And also as well, we thought, right, whilst we've got them, we will um, download their meters or pumps or Libras or whatever, because they're there, we can do it um, and get it and get some readings. But also we had to consider that we were using probably three boxes of DCAs and a quality control at uh, each session, um, costing six sixty nine a cartridge and two hundred pound a clinic, really. But our managers were kept quite happy for us to do this. We had two dedicated parking slots, six metres apart, and what happened was the child would, or the the parent would text us when they arrived, told us what car they're in, they'd wash the the um, their finger. We'd pop out in our full um, PPE um, and suck up the blood and download the meter if needed or pump. And then we asked them to stay there for six minutes. Now we deliberately said that they needed to stay there because if the, if the system failed and we had to do a, another um, finger click, it would be really annoying for them to have gone, to come all that way and then um, gone back to home without a, a reading. Um, but the families were quite happy to do this and we told them there and then of the HP1 results um, to the child and family and then they could drive away and we document it in the, the notes. Um, as I say, we were quite sceptical initially um, to see if anybody would actually turn up for six and a half minutes, but we were surprised. Thank you for the next slide. So as you can see, um, we had initially, there was 329 appointments over 12 uh, DCA drive through clinics. And we had 214 children attend. 35 of them um, were, weren't brought, but they may very well have um, rebooked for another appointment. And there was um, 80 children who ca either canceled or rebooked or they'd been to the GPs recently with HbA1cs. So um, we did have a reading for them, but it just wasn't accounted into this, um, this DCA clinic. Next one. So, so we looked at the, these um, 12 clinics and we calculated it and um, the mean HbA1c was 58 millimoles per mole, which we were really surprised at and were pleased. And 31 um, children had um, less than 48 millimoles per mole 
100 children had between 49 and 59 millimoles per mole. 66 of them had 60 to 69. And then the, the, the poorer um, control children, there was 13 who had between 70 and 80. And then the usual naughty boys and girls, we had three of them with more than 81 um, millimoles per, per mole. And interestingly, one of those ones which had the 81 was admitted for stabilisation. Um, so the next slide, Holly, is just really the same information, but on, um, on a column graph, as you can see. So obviously we still would like more children to have HbA1Cs of um, in the less than 48 remit, but um, you know the, the 60 to 69 ones are reducing, which we're quite pleased about. So the next one is pictures of my crazy mad team. And all these um, consent was given by them, the families. Um, we were quite lucky the first couple of days, a um, um, few sessions, it was lovely and warm. And um, but we did have some very wet sessions where we were in our high vis jackets and getting soaked to the skin. But um, the children really enjoyed it and we loved seeing our um, families again. It was it was brilliant and it's just made us realise that's why we like being diabetes nurses really. And then what we did do is we asked, we've got a, a charitable um, a charitable um, organisation called SCID, which is a parents group, and we asked them if they could do some comments and um, to see if there's any positive or negative that we could improve on our on what we're doing. And if you'd like to do them, Holly, the next slide. So some of them are, um, you know, you feel a bit embarrassed when you look at them. But you just say it was very efficient and we like to see our HbA1c that we're going in the right direction. Great idea and really, really smoothly ran. Um, and I think it's a great, you know, it's, it's great to do, a great idea. And um, I think really overall there was, it was all positive. There was no negative um, comments at all for, um, what we were, were doing really and we're still doing that at the minute and we will carry on doing it until we're allowed to do um, our our face-to-face -face clinics which we're hoping is soon and um, this is my team this is our mad team which I thank for their flexibilities and just wanting to get on with it and um, and help our families of um, diabetes, our children with diabetes, that they can um, work with us really. So I would like to thank our team because they are fabulous. So. And that's my quick presentation. Thank you so much. Um, let's see if we can get questions coming in. Uh, OK, I've got a question here. What percentage of your caseload attended these HbA1c clinics? Do you see them being viable in the long term? Well, I think um, if we're still doing it, it all depends, doesn't it, what happens with clinics? Because realistically, what we would like is face to face clinics that we would do the DCA, we would download their meters, we'd look at sites and things. So hopefully this is just an interim thing um, that we would do um, whilst we can't do face to face clinics so that the families can find the HbA1c um, results really. What was the other question, Holly? Uh, what so, percentage of your caseload attended? So, so actually, um, we had about 85% um, wow. um, attend. And um, <clears throat> as I say that we've, we're still running some. So if we didn't catch them on one um, 
um, session, they could move it to another session. And we did try to keep it to cohorts of um, the nurse whose, whose clinic it would be. Um, they would see them um, preferably. But other than that, um, it was um, it has turned out quite well and we've enjoyed it as well. We've had fun. Excellent. OK, well, um, moving on then to our next presenter, uh, we've got Dr Robert French, who is a research fellow at the University of Cardiff. Uh, Robert, are you happy to present your slides or should I try and load them? Uh, no, I just my uh, my screen's just gone slightly funny now after all working perfectly before. <laughs> um, I can confirm we practiced and it was fine. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> how does that look? That looks. Uh, hang on. Yeah, that looks great. Okay. Good. Um, Great. OK, so our title is uh, Linking Educational HbA1c Outcomes Using MPDA Data. Um, by education here, we're thinking about sort of schools, attainment, school, um, uh, school absence, and uh, also university participation, university atten uh, attainment and so on. OK, right. Uh, so my background is in statistics. I, um, uh, I did a lot of modelling, multi-level modelling of the school attainment and you know, other sort of health modelling as well. And, um, and uh, so I got dragged into diabetes by these two guys on the slide here. So Professor John Gregory, who's a uh, professor of paediatric diabetes, and uh, Colin Dyer, who's a professor of adult diabetes. And um, they were busy sort of getting the Brecon cohort, which is a register of children with type 1 diabetes um, in Wales diagnosed before age 15. And it goes back to 1995. And they were linking that into the sale data bank, which is a, a Welsh data bank of um, you know, lots of GP, hospital and um, education and other data sets. And so they were able to look at uh, hospital admissions uh, for children with diabetes. And that was a paper led by Adrian Sayers. I, I came in to help a bit with the stats on that. And then we realised there was some scope to do some education attainment studies or you know, how does education affect diabetes. And so we started to apply for funding for that back in 2014. And we got some funding about two years later and, and we started in 2016. Um, there's also studies looking at you know, type 1 diabetes and mortality, um, primary care sort of, uh, visits, uh, pregnancy outcomes and also alcohol related admissions. OK, OK, so this slide for me summarises about 90 percent of the work of the project. Um, effectively, this maps across the ages of the child and young person, some life events and then the data sets that we use to try and explore these. So you know, a child's born, they start school age five. Um, there are some tests maybe at the end of primary school and the end of secondary school. Um, they might attend university or, or not and then um, you know, go into employment. Uh, along the way, there'll be um, changes in treatment and, and other things happening. So the data sets we tried to link was uh, schools data sets, um, post compulsory or 16 plus education data, university data, a graduate destinations de data set, but that only included where you know, where, where the graduates go on to further study or employment, um, you know, their income levels and so on. Um, the national paediatric diabetes audits and the national diabetes audits after progression and um, here we're focusing on uh, HbA1c's and in the adults as also care processes and some contextual information. Um, we're also adding the 2011 census um, and this is to have a better indicator of the family. So a, a lot of the um, sort of yeah. not um, statistical work, but a lot of the kind of uh, patient feedback was about it's about what's going on in the household, perhaps that affects the HbA1c and the education. So we thought it would be important to include that. Um, I should also say that all this linkage has been completed for Wales and we're currently now trying to reproduce this for England, um, which will give us a sample size about 18 times as large and it'll help uh, with power with a certain number of the, as we try to chop up some of the analysis to try and think about um, you know, the timing of diagnosis or perhaps you know, high and low achieving children you know, prior to a diagnosis. It'll give us more power to, to look at those because we, we have looked at them, but we haven't uh, been able to see much with our smaller Welsh sample. Um, the other thing I should say is that we're setting this up as a research database now. So previously this was a project specific approvals for our research questions of, of the project team involved with this. But um, 
the new sort of uh, governance that we're setting up to improve the Welsh linkage and, and get the English data will be a research database, which means other researchers can apply to use the data to answer other research questions. So it might be you know, about children with special educational needs or perhaps if you're interested in exclusions, uh, school, school exclusions, or perhaps even you know, other, other diabetes outcomes. Um, this research database sort of framework also allows people to add other health data sets. So this could be other you know, local diabetes health data sets that you've got, or it could be you know, retinopathy screening, for example, um, or it could be even other other health conditions. So the um, Dougal Hargreaves is going to add the epilepsy audit. Um, that's going to be one of our sort of test cases for, for, for this. So I think for other users of this data, I think it's going to be a lot more straightforward uh, to access than we uh, than we found it, it, it took, uh, as Holly will and Justin will attest, it took a significant amount of time and effort to, to get these data sets linked. Okay. Right, so this, uh, well, so linking data sets requires the use of you know, sensitive health data, you send other sort of personal information, but also your, your personal identifiers, your, your name, date of birth, postcode, NHS number, and so on. And I think it's important to recognize the contribution that patients are making by allowing us to use this data. And, and part of that is what we actually do to make sure that this is done in such a, like a privacy preserving way or in the most secure way possible. And so I'm just gonna take a moment to explain how we actually process this data, which perhaps, Perhaps isn't you know, perhaps it's a bit boring or whatever, but I think it's important to say we are doing everything we can to protect the data. And of course, you know, in order for data providers to give us the data, they, they're very um, they're very interested in how, how we do this. So the first is each of the data providers we've got at the top. So here we've got one example of an education data set, the higher education data, and one example of the a health data set, the um, NPDA held by RCPCH. Um, and they hold the identifiers and then they hold the substantive data. We separate out these and have separate processing for the identifiers and the substantive data. And this is helpful because it makes the health data less sensitive because it's not attached to an individual and also the same for the identifiers. The identifiers are processed uh, by a trusted third party. So for Welsh data, that's MWIS and for English data, that's DFE. They are um, the real world identifiers are hashed into a, a if you like a de-identified or anonymized linkage ID, which is then passed to the repository. Um, again, for Wales, this is SAIL. For England, this is uh, Office of National Statistics. The substantive data, like I said before, it tracks directly or is passed directly to the um, repository. So hopefully though, we've got a sense that everything we can do to, to keep this secure is, is done. We have to have a special legal basis for processing these uh, health identifiers called the Section 251 which is you know, very rigorous in, in, in the approvals. Okay, um, right. The other sort of safeguards that are in place are information and opt-outs. Uh, we must ensure that all the information is available uh, to the patients on what's being done with the data. So the first line of defense is data providers um, um, who for the NPDA and the NDA who sort of have fair processing notices on their websites explaining the data will be used for research they have um, posters and GPs and we have a project website as well um, which also has specific fair processing notices. I mean one of the feedback, feedback we got on this from our PPI group was that you know, we expect our health data to be used for research but um, you know, we weren't really sure it's being used for all these other types of uses you know, linked with education or other things and I think there is a challenge there for, for researchers to, and data providers to really communicate clearly the kind of uses the data is being used for because you know, as one patient said, how, how can I opt out if I don't know I'm being included in the study? Um, so those are the safeguards. And um, also we're interested in the benefits. So, and again, the, the patients were happy to take the safeguards on trust. Um, it was more data providers and, and the HRA who we had to convince with those, but the public benefits are very important. And one of the things the patients said was that we want to see, we don't mind sharing our data if there are real world benefits, if it's going to help somebody. And here we've got these kind of like theoretical, you know, Office for National Statistics styles for public benefits. But actually, the challenge to us is how do we actually make these benefits real world to someone with diabetes? Because as an academic researcher, my incentives are to get an academic paper out and maybe you know, I can do a policy report or something. But it's actually much more challenging to get that fed back. I mean, luckily, I'm in a school of medicine working with, um, you know, with clinicians so we can have pathways to, to feedback and equally we're trying the schools to contact um, those in Department for Education and um, the Welsh Government who are responsible for uh, supporting children with additional learning needs to kind of try and think about the mechanisms and Diabetes UK have also been very helpful there in, 
uh, you're stating the kind of things that um, children might need. But I'd say there is a battle there because schools are, are geared up to support children with dyslexia or kind of health conditions where there's a really obvious link with um, uh, with their educational outcomes. And I think where something's less clear or perhaps where it's not affecting everybody with diabetes in the same way, I think there's more of a battle to um, to, to get some, some some kind of change. So I won't go through the details of these for just to save time, but um, uh, so we, before we started the research, we did a systematic review um, and the two standards that were kind of implied here was that we had um, uh, only studies that were representative nationally, so not ones that just used like a local clinic or a kind of um, a convenience sample. And also we specified that it had to be high stakes testing. So that's something like the GCSEs or A-levels where it's something that affects your adult life chances, not just like a, you know, a test at age 11 or um, that's kind of more useful for the school rather than um, actually related to the individual. Um, so most, we had about 3,000 papers, about 20 were sort of, of interest, but perhaps most didn't meet, the, meet those quality criteria. As we're sort of always going about Swedish studies, it was two Swedish studies which did meet the inclusion criteria and their, um, their findings were a very small but significant decrease in the medial final grade. And uh, the conclusion was more research was needed, which was handy because that's what we were about to do. Um, so this is the framework, if you like, or how we, how we, I kind of tend to think about this. So we started off with this first arrow that diabetes, uh, diagnosis of diabetes might affect things like attendance, achievement and progression to higher education. Equally, these things or other things about the school experience might affect HbA1c. So this is coming both ways and this is a real challenge for modelling. And, and thirdly, there are other factors which affect motivation, um, intelligence and that can affect both educational outcomes and health outcomes. And I think really trying to say, oh, we've solved it by just identifying one of these areas isn't enough. I don't think with the Welsh data we're really able to unpick this properly, but um, I think hopefully with the English data we'll be able to get more um, more. Uh, more into that. Um, in terms of covariates, we have age of diagnosis, gender, socioeconomic status and, and other things that we wish to condition for, and then clustering. And this, this sort of tied into my methodological background of um, children nested in uh, families or neighbourhoods or schools and the effects of these clusters on, on outcomes. Right. Um, in terms of the descriptive statistics, I, we just had three samples, uh, 18 cohorts of children with uh, absence data, that's a, sc a school year effectively, and um, eight cohorts of children with uh, attainment data, that's GCSEs, and six cohorts who had progressed to university. Um, good numbers of individuals who are using complete population controls, um, but we know you know only a few children per school, uh, more boys and uh, girls as we'd expect, um, slightly, well about, about half as much again it, were qualifying for special educational needs in the, the sample with type 1 diabetes, which I thought was interesting. And then also um, slightly higher free school meals, which is our de deprivation measure. So a child, you know, whether a child qualifies for free school meals. Okay, so I'm going to just show you two slides of results. Um, there are some supplementary analysis which might uh, might be interesting. They're going to be in the paper, so I, I won't waste, I won't spend time on those. But this graph shows two models. The uh, model on the left is just comparing children with diabetes um, versus our population controls. Um, and this, this one is looking at you know, quintiles or you know, 20, 20, cutting the HbA1c profile into five, um, five groups. Uh, so with the best, uh, lowest HbA1c and the highest HbA1c. So our outcome measure in this first graph is um, attendance. And here we see the zero level, and this is excess days of, excess sessions of absence for children uh, who don't have diabetes. And then for children with diabetes, we have almost nine excess sessions, that's half days of, uh, absence on average. So that, 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 that's quite a sizable difference. When we cut it down and rather than just look at all children, we think about um, those uh, quintiles of HbA1c, we see even those with the best, the lowest HbA1c have almost seven excess days of absence, whereas those with the highest HbA1c have uh, almost 15. Um, and then our second graph is looking at attainment. So it uses the same structure. If zero is our line for children without diabetes, our controls, children with diabetes have uh, on average almost exactly the same attendance, which, excuse me, attainment, which is uh, great news. Whereas uh, when we start to break it down by HbA1c, we see overperformance in the group with the lowest HbA1c and um, 
underperformance in the group with the highest HB1C. And indeed, so we think about uh, these differences of being about four grades uh, higher for children uh, with the lowest HB1C. So if the average child, or we take one child who's got eight Cs as an average, and then say, well, if that same child with the same socioeconomic status, same um, gender, same everything um, that we can tr control for, had type, uh, type 1 diabetes and the um, the lowest HB1, say they'd achieve uh, four Cs and four Bs, whereas those with the highest HB1C would achieve the three Cs and five Ds. So quite quite a bit, quite a sizable difference. Um, okay, we can come back to these slides perhaps if there's questions, but effectively we're adjusting. Uh, how does uh, attainment differ by once we adjust for school absence? How does attainment differ um, when we control for your previous attainment? So controlling for your key stage 2, 8, 11 scores, and then also uh, education attainment by age of diagnosis. So this is getting a sense of to what degree is the exposure of diabetes uh, affecting your attainment. Um, finally, there's this, another graph of progression going to university. And again, we see the same um, uh, same kind of slope in that, in that graph. Um, so just to summarise some conclusions, oh, excuse the typo, um, but uh, education diabetes outcomes, they seem to go hand in hand. So the overperformance of the children with the lowest HbA1c kind of perhaps undermines this story that there's a biological mechanism of there's, some, there's something happening with your diabetes that's then affecting your brain function, which is affecting your attain, uh, um, attain, attainment. It's perhaps more to do with um, there are factors which affect your diabetes management and equally affect your um, uh, school attainment. Um, and I'll stop there. I think I can say a lot more, but uh, is that OK? Holly, I was just looking at the time. That, that's excellent, Rob. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's, it's really nice to be able to present uh, something at this conference that shows that the data that is submitted by clinicians taking part in the MPDA, it does have a life even outside of the audit. You don't get to share very much data. It's a very stringent um, protocol. I think it took us about a year to get permission to share with you. Um, quite rightly, absolutely, um, but yeah. we were really pleased to be able to support that study. We were very relieved um, and happy to see that it's absolutely possible to have uh, diabetes and achieve very well in certain circumstances, which neatly brings us on to our next speaker, um, who is Katie, Katie Lamb. Um, Katie is currently studying history of art at Birmingham University and she is also our cover star of the 1819 report as she produced that lovely image of herself with her um I think it's your nurse and your dietitian isn't it yeah um, and your pump so I'm um, just really pleased to have you here today to to talk about your work um in relation to your diabetes are you able to share your slides I hope so can you see <laughs> can we see those it's, I think it's coming. Oh, yeah, excellent. If you just go to slideshow mode. I think it's coming. <laughs> yeah, no, this is this is the smoothest. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. OK, so thank you so much for having me here. I'm so. Oh, I think it's gone. No, it's not. It's there. Is it gone? OK, um, I'm so excited to be able to share some of my um, journey with you all um, and to be able to talk through some of my artwork. Um, obviously I've produced quite a bit over the last 18 years so this is my best attempt to give you a good taste. <laughs> I've been diabetic since February 2003 um, which was just before I turned two years old so as a toddler I can't remember anything about that but I do know it's shaped my experience and my life quite dramatically. Um, it was a relatively non-dramatic diagnosis. There was no DKA, fortunately, um, but I know it was quite a radical change for my parents who had to all of a sudden pin down and inject their 23 months old um, to keep her alive, which is not the ideal situation. But from those very early days, art and diabetes have been really closely connected in my mind. Um, I've never understood why creativity and medicine seems to be so polarised, when for me they've always seemed really closely linked. 
So I would draw pictures for my nurse before every single clinic and I would make sure not to miss a single one, um, even if that meant I was slightly late sometimes. <laughs> um, that would give me something to really look forward to and distract me from anything not so nice that was going on diabetes wise. Um, so these are some of the images that I have always kept coming back to. There are some places, some objects and patterns that seem to pop up over and over again in my artwork. Um, so the brightly coloured walls of the children's clinic, um, the sticker on my blood glucose meter uh, circa 2006 and my trusty children's insulin pen. Um, they've always seemed really positive to me and I, I love that I've been able to draw them again and again and see how they've changed through the years. So making this artwork has always been part of a really close relationship with my team. Um, I had the same DSN from my diagnosis in 2003 all the way until I left transition in 2019. Um, my whole PEDS team was a kind of extended family. Um, and so I made this painting to kind of represent how even the smallest things, maybe not even the most diabetes related things, can make a huge impact on our lives. Um, so at my school, we had to learn three languages and I was not particularly great at any of them. <laughs> but my nurse spoke fluent German. And so at every clinic, she would sit with me and help me with my German homework. And one of the things she would make me do every time I had a blood test was to count backwards from 20 in German. It was a great way to distract me from what was happening and to help me practice my German skills. And now years and years after we started doing this, um, even though I'm fairly confident with having blood taken, as soon as I sit down, I begin counting backwards from 20 in German. And I think of her and all of those happy times that we spent together. But this really close relationship, of course, had to come to an end at some point, um, which I knew I would never be uh, too keen on. Um, by the time I reached transition, I've been diabetic for over 15 years. I was prefect at my grammar school. I was working two extra jobs. Um, and to be honest, I was exhausted. Uh, I went through a really horrible phase of burnout um, and I could not see past my blood sugars. I felt like I was failing at pretty much everything and I really needed someone to kind of reach out a hand and drag me back to the surface um, and let me take a breath. Um, so I think some people might have seen one of these paintings already. Um, it isn't my favourite painting to look at, but I think that's because it represents the most clearly, I think, how I felt at that time. Um, that's a real download that I had printed off that night when I painted this. And I was so ashamed of these blood sugars. I was so upset um, and angry that I'd let them happen. Um, and now I think if we look at them, they're probably not so horrific. Um, I felt like I was failing everyone and letting everyone down. Um, and I did these portraits um, as artist studies, but I think they probably speak quite a bit as to how I was feeling at the time. Um, I started taking overdoses of insulin and I was inducing these really horrible hypos um, and I was losing myself in this spiral and I think that speaks kind of to losing my identity. Um, I didn't know who I was or what I was doing um, and leaving paediatrics I felt was partly losing part of myself um, which was a really difficult time but that same paediatric team was there to give me that helping hand and they were the ones that did drag me back to the surface um, and probably quite literally saved my life. Um, they taught me that even if um, you know I had diabetes I could still do whatever I wanted to do and be whoever I wanted to be and that I could still have a good life and I could still take care of myself even if it wasn't quite as perfect as I maybe wanted it to be. Um, it took me a while to understand what that meant. Um, and I, I started my university course very shortly after this. And we were learning about ancient Greek sculpture. And that's when it all kind of clicked, that these things are dragged out of the ground, all beaten up and uh, chipped and imperfect. 
but they're still precious and they're worth more than you could maybe ever imagine. Um, so I started to draw these to help remind myself of the idea. So I'm now in a much better place and still holding on to all of those things that I learned from my paediatric team. Um, I've started making these digital commissions on Instagram to help share that message with other members of the community who um, really enjoy the sense of empowerment and I really love that I'm able to, to share that with them. Um, of course, there's a lot more art than I can talk about in this 10 minutes. Um, so if you would like to check out my Instagram or my Twitter or contact me on my email, I would be more than happy to uh, chat with you or share any more artwork if that's what anyone wants. So thank you very much for listening. I think that's the end of my time. Oh, thank you so much, Katie. What an incredibly powerful and inspirational note to end on. Um, amazing that you're doing history of art but i really hope you keep 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 this up you're incredibly talented and an incredible speaker so thank you so wow. much thank you so much for joining us today really appreciate it we've got some comments coming in thank you thank you um from from people in the audience um yeah that's incredibly inspirational we're going to we're going to um record all of this and put it on put it on our website at a certain point and I'm sure um, this will be a very popular <laughs> that we can share to inspire not just clinicians but other families who might be struggling at certain points. Um, so yeah thank you so much Amazing. for your time. Thank oh, you. another comment here. It is all about positive attitude which you've demonstrated extremely well not with your lovely presentation but also with the lovely smile you've kept on your face. <laughs> and that. Everyone, amazing work, well done. Yeah, I, I think we can expect quite a few more comments <laughs> like that, but I would like to finish on, on time. So um, thank you so much. Um, we'll forward you obviously everything that, that comes in. Um, our other speakers, we've not had time to get through every single question. I know that's really frustrating if you're there at home or at your desk or in your, your office and you've not had your question responded to. So um, we'll try and collect those unanswered questions, get some responses and feed them back to everyone at a certain point. So we've got one minute left and I just wanted to use that time again to thank everyone participating in the NPDA so much for your support or your data um, which we can use to evidence the incredible improvement journey that paediatric diabetes is on in England and Wales. We're, it, everything is going in the right direction. Covid has been a bit of a blip but we're really looking forward to, to evidencing further improvement as we go and I also just wanted to say a massive thank you to the team who's kept the show on the road the last year as I, as I said at the beginning we haven't been in the same room together we haven't seen each other since March and I've just been overwhelmed by how well everyone has coped um, shout out to Karina our project coordinator who has been producing this conference uh, making sure we're on screen at the right point um, thank you, Karina. Um, this submission process, you've probably talked to about half of our participants. So yeah, just thank you so much for your relentlessly positive attitude. Syra, again, um, Syra is our analyst. Uh, Justin produced a lot of her work. We're just incredibly lucky to have such talented individuals supporting our team. And Justin, our clinical lead. Um, yeah, what a guy. Thank you so much for your continued support. Um, yeah, you've you've retired from diabetes this year, but we're so pleased that we've still got our claws in you. So yeah, thank you so much for your support and also to every member of our project board, our data setting methodology group. It's just so inspiring to work with such an incredibly motivated and talented and creative bunch of individuals. So on that note, we'll say goodbye. And um, oh, Justin, are you, are you trying to say something? No, just to thank everybody. Okay. Great. All right then. Yeah, thanks very much. Hope you have a lovely weekend and a lovely afternoon. Thanks for joining us.